Okay, good evening, Mocha friends. I'm Neil Wu Gibbs, Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives at the Museum of Chinese in America. The holiday season continues as Lunar New Year is fast approaching. The Year of the Rabbit starts on January 22nd. Since Lunar New Year is a time for new beginnings and family gatherings, we want to start celebrating with you, the Mocha family. We proudly present Mocha Fest 2023, an annual celebration of the Lunar New Year with programming for all ages. We are hosting family, friendly activity and virtual programming through February 16. Learn more and register for our learn more and register for our Lunar New Year programs and events at mocha.nyc.org slash calendar. Today, we welcome you to Mocha Cooks with Maggie Ju, as you will learn the secrets of cooking your delicious old Beijing fried sauce noodles and shredded potato salad. Proof from the critically acclaimed Chinese, Chinese homestyle everyday plant-based recipes for takeout, dim sum, noodles, and more. These two easy-to-follow recipes were crafted by Maggie, a New York-based blogger, writer, recipe developer, and photographer. With her popular blog, Omi Wolf's Cookbook, Maggi Zhu is the go-to person for traditional Chinese recipe for the Western modern cook and kitchen. Uh, over the past few years, she has been incorporating more plant-based cooking into her diet. In Chinese home style, Maggi shares 90 foolproof plant-based recipes that pack all the flavor and none of the meat, building on a foundation of plant-based and vegetable-forward dishes found in Chinese cuisine. These umami-rich recipes are inspired by the comforting everyday dishes Maggi grew up eating in northern China and discovered in her travels throughout the country, along with takeout favorites she became familiar with after moving to the United States. Made with fresh ingredients and minimum oil and sugar, the salad, soup, stir-fried, braises, dumplings, and more are not only delicious, but also demonstrate the impact of aromatics. The benefit of using homemade sauces and condiments, how to cook tofu for maximum flavor and texture, and versatile cooking techniques. Ms. Zhu will also share the stories and talk about the experience writing her cookbook with Chef King Lam Ko, author of the award-winning cookbook, Phoenix Clouds and Jade Trees, Essential Techniques of Authentic Chinese Cooking. If you enjoy this public program, we hope you will consider making a gift to become part of a continuing lifeline for Mocha. No amount is too little and we greatly appreciate your generosity. Your contribution helps sustain our beloved institution and supports the creation of new programming that will bring comfort and inspiration to more communities. Lastly, this program is brought to you by Mocha friends and partners, including Bloomberg Philanthropies. This program is also supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Without further ado, I will let our moderator, Kian, to further introduce the program and our guest, Chef Maggi. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Muka Cooks. And uh, today we have Maggi Chu, uh, who is an amazing food blogger and she has some incredible recipes on her blog and she just published a cookbook um, and it's a vegetarian uh, plant-based cookbook and so um, uh, Maggie is going to uh, demonstrate two very interesting recipes um, on um, uh, this session. So Maggie, welcome. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Maggie? That's good. Hi. Is it good? Yeah. Yes. Now we can hear Great. you. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome. So uh, we're we're really excited to have you uh, on the program, and um, you know, I'm. I think you know all the all all our viewers are, are interested in finding out, uh, learning mm -hmm. about your recipe. So let's just dive into it right away and see yeah. uh, what kind of recipes that you're going to do. We're doing two recipes today, right? One yes. is a uh, is a potato salad and then the other mm -hmm. one is da, da jiang mian, which is a yeah. uh, Fried sauce uh, uh, old Beijing noodle. Okay, yeah. let's get going. Introduce so I, the, the salad to us, yeah. 
Yeah. So I want to start with a salad. So this is really special. It's a family recipe uh, that uh, my mom has been making it for so many years uh, when I was growing up. So it uses a interesting techniques. So basically you cut the potato really thin into like those thin, thin threads and you quickly blanch them. So instead of you cook through the potato, you actually kind of um, cook it into like old Dante texture. It's like half cooked through, I'd say like 60% cooked through. So it's very crispy. It's, still, it's yeah. crispy. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, and also it, it does hold its shape. It's that, it doesn't have that like very grainy texture. And once this is done, so I have those already prepped. Um, mm -hmm. This is pretty easy. We just like blanch them uh, for like a minute mm -hmm. and then uh, put in the ice bath to stop cooking and then drain them really well. Um, oh, and also I want to add that um, before blanching, if you prep this early on, you know, if like, you're like, oh, I want to cut this, but cook it later, you should soak the shredded potato in the ice water so they won't change color, so keep it fresh. So uh, this is already blanched. So uh, is there after, any hmm? is there any particular type of potatoes that you would, would recommend? I, use, I mean, rusted I use those like or the, golden. Yeah, the golden, mm -hmm. uh, the golden potato, the smooth one, it, because it has right. a more like a crunchy texture and it does not contain uh -huh. that much starch. Right, right. Okay, yeah. good because rusted, rusted is starchy and and so it yeah. probably if you, if you blanch it will just disintegrate. Just go apart. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Good, so good. so this is prepped, uh, and then it it uses a few really simple ingredients. I'm just going to start with. So it uses a lot of garlic. Uh, so what you do is you just uh, these are grated garlic. I put them on top of the potato. So I actually put them here. Um, this is uh, main seasoning, and then there's salt here. Oh, just just sprinkle it here. And then the next step is the, uh, the really the key. So I'm going to heat up uh, aromatic oil by just uh, heat up this, uh, this is peanut oil. I'm gonna heat it up really hot. And then I'll add the citron peppercorn and dried mm -hmm. chili pepper. So okay. these two ingredients are really common in Chinese, like all kinds of like simple stir fries and salad because these two ingredients infuse like a really nice umami, a slightly spicy, and this has that numbing sensation. And when you uh, infuse this to hot oil, it has this like really strong aroma. And then I'm gonna pour the oil, uh, hot oil over the potato. So it will kind of quickly cook through the ingredients, uh, you know, like the aromatics and, the, you know, slightly cook it and to make it really, mm -hmm. really nice. So I'm gonna just heat this up real quick. Uh, and then I'm gonna add the oil here. Yeah, this is gonna take so, a, yeah. Is there any other, any other kind of oil that you can recommend other than peanut oil? Like uh, I'd will, say uh, any, any neutral oil will be good. Like uh, vegetable, canola, grape seed, uh, mm -hmm. avocado oil, they're, they're all very great. Um, mm -hmm. And oh, I also want to mention like uh, for the citron peppercorn. So actually originally, we use, we, like at home, we usually use the whole citron peppercorn. So basically it, it's the same uh, method. You just put them in, but then after it's heated, we scoop it out, um, you know, so you'll have the flavor in it. But I really, I, here, uh, like in the US, I found this, uh, I really like the Mala Market, you know, the citron peppercorn grind, grinder. They have those like really fresh premium citron peppercorn. And then I put them in this grinder and I think it's really convenient because it takes less time to cook it. And then you have you don't have to, you know, strain it. You don't have to scoop them out. Uh, and then so you leave, so, so you leave the, yeah. the because this, uh, peppercorn in there, yeah. Yeah, it's grounded. So it, I, I'm just gonna leave ground, it in. Right. So, yeah. So this is good. I'm gonna add this in. And the chili pepper. So these chili peppers are just um, dried. I can show you here. It's called facing heaven chili. So it has mm -hmm. this like, uh, we're gonna show you here. It's like slightly long, medium spicy, um, very fragrant, like not very spicy. So I'd say if you like a spicy dish, I would just cut the chili pepper directly and 
put the peppers and the seed together in the oil. So it will be have like a very spicy taste. But for this one, I prefer it a little bit milder, like not like spicy. So I already so you took the seeds out. I removed you the took seeds. the seeds out. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a minute to um I usually wait until the uh, chili peppers start to turn kind of like a dark red. But you you shouldn't wait too long until it's like turning black. It's just it's just gonna burn the chili pepper, but I, so I would give cook, it a minute. Yeah. You would cook this over like maybe a, a medium heat or low heat? Or... Yeah, I'm I'm cooking this over like a medium heat. And I, okay. I usually give it like say two minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just let it cook a little bit sooner. So what's that? Yeah, you guys you already I, I, it's it start to smell so good. I already can smell <laughs> this. Yeah, like smoky, like very smoky and fragrant. Right, right. Yeah. I, like I can, wish like, we can. Yeah. I wish we can smell it. <laughs> I know you. You can see it start to get pretty dark. So now I'm just gonna stop this now, and then I'm just gonna pour this over. Can you hear the sound? It's like it has this nice sizzle the sound. Sizzling sound. Yeah, yeah the sizzling, and very very fragrant. Also, the hot oil, you know, it's like it, it kind of cooks through the, it will cook the garlic a little bit and it will melt the salt. So it's perfect. Here. So I'm, I'm just going to mix this together. Really simple. Don't even, we don't even use soy sauce. I feel like if you want to add like an extra flavor, you can use a little bit, like a touch of soy sauce, but I feel like is enough just for the, just by using the salt, this will be really a nice, nice dish. So yeah, it's, this is pretty much it. it you can also, it looks really like plain, but it smells so good right now. It's garlicky and smoky and very- Right, lovely. right. Yeah. The, the garlic and the spices just, I'm sure will just create an incredible so good. Uh, fragrance and, and flavor. Yeah. And usually, oh, I forgot. Uh, I'm going to pull out the cilantro here. <clears throat> so yeah, it's just a little bit garnish. I think sliced green onion make a nice, gar uh, nice garnish too, but I like to use like fresh cilantro. This is just a really simple and tasty. That looks wonderful. So, I mean, this is very interesting. Potato is not usually a, a staple of Chinese uh, uh, diet, right? So how, how did um, do you um, think, how, how did the potato I, become, become like a, a part of Chinese diet? I, I actually, we eat a, a bit, quite a bit of potato in Northern China. I feel like yeah. it's, um, I, I, it's not like an everyday thing. Like we don't, maybe we don't cook it that often, but it's one of those, uh, because you know, Northern China is really cold. Right. So we right. have, uh, I, I remember back in the, when I was like very small, like in elementary school, we have like very limited uh, vegetable options, especially mm -hmm. in winter, pretty much like all you can get is Napa cabbage, like for anything leafy. Right. Uh, these days mm -hmm. you can get almost everything like, like green stuff, you know, all kinds of like pea shoots and like all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it used to be just like green beans and uh, Napa cabbage. And potato is one of those things like in winter it's just so easy because you can store a lot of them uh, at home mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. we make make them into stews. So usually mm -hmm. it's like a braised dish that has like maybe it's like soy sauce based. Sometimes it's like meat based, uh, but mm -hmm. usually it's like a very flavorful brown sauce or like sometimes even tomato and brown sauce together. And then we braise, you know, like green beans and the potato and, and the corn. And uh, you know, it's like those stew, it's like a north, it's like Dongbei dish, it's a northern dish. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and we do use uh potato in stir fries. Actually, I have that recipe in the in the cookbook called Di San Xian, called uh mm -hmm. stir fried three treasures. It's a uh stir fried potato, uh eggplant, and pepper. So these are kind of like a northern Chinese style stir fry. Uh, mm -hmm. That use those like uh, some of the staples that like you know is pretty popular mm -hmm. in northern China, and then you know uh, like like this dish we in, we use potato in the salad. Right. Um, there are a couple of questions from mm -hmm. um, the viewers. Uh, 
it's one one of the questions is saying that uh, uh, can you sub what kind of substitute can you use for the chili that you mentioned instead of the uh, you know the heaven heaven facing chili uh, is there some other type of dry chili I feel that you like, can substitute I feel like a lot of chili like as long as it's not super spicy like if mm -hmm. you don't want a super spicy one I feel like a lot of like I'd say Mexican chili pepper you if you find those like medium sized ones i yeah if you I, like, I, yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, I, I feel I, like I, if, I, you, I, if you like the smoky flavor you can't get the smoky one but i feel like it doesn't right. have to be very smoky right i yeah. i i i think that the uh, in uh, the mexican uh, dried chili they they do come in like a smaller which i think uh, what is it? I think I believe it's a serrano dried. Um, yeah. Um, red chili. So, uh, so, so serrano is a little bit spicy. Serrano is a little bit spicy. Yeah. I would remove the seeds. Remove the seed, right? Yeah. And also, um, the Sichuan peppercorn. Um, if you don't grind them, will it not be as spicy or as flavorful? If you, uh, that's also a question that was. Um, I would. Asked. I would add a little bit more. So Sichuan peppercorn is a. This is a kind of. A, um. You you have to kind of know like maybe like some trial trials and error I'd say because sometimes it's super fresh and you really mm -hmm. just need a little bit it can get pretty numbing like it's like mm -hmm. really it's really strong and then you know when you put it in the cabinet for like I don't know a couple months or like half a year it kind of slowly loses fragrance and it's really really noticeable so I'd mm -hmm. say you start you can start with the same amount like stated in this recipe when you use the whole and you know you. And you, it takes a little bit longer to cook. So I would add it maybe 30 seconds to one minute before the chili pepper, because it takes mm -hmm. a minute to release the fragrance. And then right. you, can take, you can take them out. Get the whole, the yeah. whole uh, pepper yeah. out, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, you add the chili pepper later and then you do the drizzle and all that stuff. But right. if, you, if you think, so you, you can do this. And if you think, oh, this is not like numbing enough, what you can do is to, <laughs> ground the cooked uh, citron peppercorn because it, it's already right. cooked it's become right. milder and you can still ground them and add back to the dish right so another yeah. question is um um did you uh, uh cut the potatoes by hand or do you use a mandolin <laughs> yeah i use my hand. like this is the hardest part of the dish uh, because you for the for the best texture i think hand cutting is the best like it, it, literally i was taking like 15 minutes just like cut this before right before so you, this, don't think, uh, video. you don't think yeah. you don't think mandolin will do oh no no, no. mandolin is great i, I love it yeah. like I, you can totally yeah. use mandolin like use it like yeah. i think it's it's totally fine yeah yeah i think i think mandolin the the, the thin mandolin one is, yeah yeah that's a pretty good really, job yeah yeah really well yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, anyway, all right. So let's um, move on to your next recipe. So the yeah. next recipe you're gonna do is uh, what is known in Beijing as Da Jiang Mian, right? Which is mm -hmm. fried uh, sauce, uh, fried noodles. sauce noodles. Yeah. And usually it's made with pork. Um, and so you have this version that is a vegetarian version. Asa, so, uh, this tell version, us. this version is very different from the original because the original, so there are two key ingredients in this dish. One is the like you said is the pork, and the, right. and the and the the main ingredients for the sauce is called uh huang jiang. You know the, the, right, the right. it's called it's the soy bean paste. Uh, it's a very salty, uh, savory. Um, you know it, it's pretty much like, it's just fermented or soy bean. So it's kind of like soy sauce, but it's like a, it's a very thick right. paste it's that you usually paste, yeah. yeah you have to dilute with quite a bit of water. Uh, add some sugar just to add flavor because it's pretty salty. And then right. you have to fry that in oil for quite a while to like, you, you have to cook it so it releases fragrance. So I, a little bit backstory. So for my family, we never use the soybean paste. My family recipe used tian mian jiang, it's the uh -huh. sweet flour paste. Right, so the right, difference right. is the, the that paste, the so sweet flour paste is like, it's just a little bit sweeter and the less salty. That's the mm -hmm. that's the one my family like to use, and my mom like to cut up the pork, you know, to like kind of like bigger pieces, and right. and she like to add a lot of onion. Right. Uh, you know, like, pork, because I think yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, I know that the pork usually is not ground. It's, it's right. cut into cut small into pieces. pieces. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's the way my mom does it. And and then I kind of change a little, little bit more. So mm -hmm. uh, in this cookbook, I use uh, black bean sauce instead of any of the, you know, not the soybean paste or the tian jiang because um, in this book, I have the previous chapter. It's in the pen, in my pantry chapter. I introduce those like really frequently used sauces in my kitchen, and mm -hmm. uh, my goal is to really try to keep the number like not overwhelmingly large. So someone when they just started cooking Chinese food, they're not like buying twenty sauces. <laughs> yeah, and right. maybe they they just use it once and then they never touch it again right. because you know it's I don't have enough recipe for it. So I <laughs> kind of did this uh tweak because I think so the the black bean sauce is actually the Korean version. I think Korean, you know, it, they also have the different version of the uh, fried sauce noodle. And a mm -hmm. lot of those recipes they do use black bean sauce. For yeah. me, I I I realized that yeah. the, the flavor is like close enough. So right. I, I decided to use my homemade black bean sauce, uh, which right. is you can find that in my uh, beginning right. chapter, uh, right. instead of, you know, like buying sauce again. So that's right. uh, my interpretation. So you I mentioned also, that yeah. you yeah. mentioned that the sajangmian is uh, is served in Korea in Korea, but actually it's also served in Japan. So it's yeah, actually they do. Uh, sajang noodles is a very very, very popular. popular noodle yeah. uh, in northern asia including korea and japan yeah they do, uh, they, do they all have it uh, they, and they cook it slightly different yeah. right right i think in, in japan they call it uh something like uh jaja jaja uh, jaja men jaja jaja men right. i think so jaja men yeah. right that's what they call but it, which actually is is, is based it's on similar. the jaja men uh, from yeah. Beijing. yeah 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 so uh, and I, I do want to yeah take a minute to just talk about the a homemade black sauce. bean sauce. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It is made with fermented <clears throat> black beans. Um, and I do feel this for this one, I like, I prefer the homemade version than the store bought because I use a lot of aromatics like ginger, garlics, and the onion in this. And always a little bit like, you know, soy sauce and then the cooking wine to add flavor. So I it basically, it has more aromatics than the store bought one. It um, sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah, I, I just like it more because it just has more flavor. But I mean, you can totally use a store bought for this dish. And I would maybe just throw in like a little bit more ginger and garlic if you use a store bought sauce. So I'm going to start with, uh, oh, and also I just want to talk through the ingredient here. Um, for the two to have the, the main ingredient in the, in the sauce are mushrooms and some tempeh. So this is pretty much what I use to replace the pork. Uh, and I, I choose these two ingredients because I think mushroom, they have, you know, they, it, it, this, these are kind of mild, but I do think they have, they add, they add some umami to the dish and I do like the texture of the mm -hmm. mushroom. Uh, and the tempeh is like, you know, it's like crunchy. <clears throat> it, it, it absorbs the flavor and it holds its shape. It has this, so you'll get the crunchy and some soft texture in this. And I really, really like that. I, I feel like you can experiment with different things, even like tofu and other stuff, but my personal choice are the, the two. So I'm going to start with uh, cooking these two ingredients. So I what I will do is to, uh, I'm going to heat up the oil and stir fry this uh, mushroom and tempeh, like just brown these two ingredients with some aromatics and quickly uh, finish with uh, some wine. And then I'll take them out and I'll cook the sauce and put everything back together. <laughs> um, yes. I'm gonna turn, does it affect the sound when if I turn on the ventilation? Is that okay? Uh, turn it on and see what happens. <laughs> I, I, I just turn it on. Can you, okay. Can you hear it? It's it's fine. Seems, it seems fine. It seems fine. Seems yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, I want to actually to, to take a quick minute to. Uh, this is my one of my favorite pen. It's a Dubai carbon steel. Uh, it's a nine inch carbon steel pen. It's like a, pretty much like a small wok, like flat bottom wok. Um, and I, I like to use this on my gas stove. I think it, 
it's like a little bit heavy than my, uh, it's a little bit heavier than nonstick, but it's lighter than a cast iron pan. So you can do the, you know, a little bit action if you want to. And uh, it holds heat really well. It's, it's just easy to maneuver. So this is what I gonna use here. So I'm gonna add the oil. So cook the ginger. Cook it really quick just to release some fragrance. Add the mushroom here. So there's a question um, yep. uh, about uh, what is the black bean? Uh, is it fermented? She wanted uh, um, Nisa or, or Halvos. Um, uh, uh, wanted to know if this was um, so, uh, fermented black bean yeah. or so fermented. But you you, you have you, yeah. you have a recipe on your book for this particular um, sauce, right? I mean, the yeah, I have the I, I have the sauce, but uh, the fermented black bean you have to buy them. So because they are actually soybeans, they are made from soybeans, right. and after and then, aging, it become black. The color just black, become black. Yeah. Uh, right. That that you have to buy. Yeah, if you want yeah, to so, make this sauce. So this, this yeah. is the, the dried one, right? The one that's like- in, Yeah, the dried one. In, in the plastic yeah. bag, usually, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and and she also wanted to know if it can be bought on we. Yes, it, I think it oh, can. Oh, yeah, yeah. I I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure, I'm sure you sure, can. Yeah, I'm quite yeah. sure you can buy them on we website. Yeah. 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 And one other question is from Annette Chow. Um, wanted to know, what is tempeh? Oh God, uh, how, do we, <laughs> how do I explain it? Oh, so these are also soybeans actually. It's, it's also fermented soybean that's pressed into yeah. a block. It's actually, yeah. this is not a ch traditional Chinese ingredient. Yeah. I it's think this Indian, is more, yeah. Indonesian, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we, we don't use this too much in China, but it's quite popular in the US. So I, I decided to have some yeah. recipe about it. But I think, like I said before, um, you can use tofu. Like I, I would I would use like firm extra firm and cut them up into like small pieces and I think it's it's gonna work just as fine. Right. You, it work well. Yeah. Right. Maybe you maybe you can use the, the pressed tofu, the one that's like uh pressed really, really uh, Yeah, firm. like it's kind of firm, yeah. yeah. And I think that would be fine. Yeah. Yeah, so tempeh actually is a, a fermented soybean that's that's pressed into into blocks. That's the what block, they are. Yeah. yeah, and then it's fermented. Uh -huh. It has um, it has this fermented flavor that not everyone likes. So it's a little bit stronger than tofu, but I think it works very well in this dish just because the sauce is very strong. Right. So I think it kind of like mass is like you know because it it does have this like very fermented taste. So I, I, I like it here though, I, because it has this firm texture. I, I kind of made it, yeah. <laughs> right. So okay, what was I, that that you were putting in? Was that uh, oh, water it, or I, wine? I just, just a little bit oil. I think it start, it looks it start to look a little bit dry. So I'm just like add a very small splash of uh, peanut oil. And then I'm gonna mm, pour okay. in the this is sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. Just to glaze the pan a little bit. Yeah, these are pretty ready because you will uh, cook these again in the sauce. So I, right. as long as they're like, they're kind of brown and, uh, well, you know, all well, the liquid but... has, the, yeah, the, all the liquid has evaporated, it's, it's ready. Turn this down. Before moving to the next, I actually forgot this. So I will add this, uh, dilute the paste with some water because this is like a pretty thick paste. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you still want to, eat, like, especially if you use a store-bought one. I think the homemade paste is actually very fragrant. It doesn't need to cook too, it doesn't need too much cooking in the, in the hot oil, but 
if you use a store-bought paste, I feel like it takes a minute to release the flavor. So it, mm -hmm. what you do is you use some water. Uh, you just mix it in. And then you cook this, like, you know, like the water will evaporate a little bit. Um, and so the sauce will thicken, but heating heating this up will just take, uh, it, will, it will become more fragrant that way. So this, I'm going to turn on the heat again. Uh, I will add the oil here. So this is actually a little bit, quite a bit of oil, which is kind of needed in this dish because the, um, what the sauce does is that, uh, especially if you use the store-bought sauce, it, it, start, it will absorb the oil. Um, and it kind of inter it like kind of like come, just just kind of soak it in and start cooking and it's like very fragrant that way. If you don't use enough oil, the the sauce will get kind of dry. So mm -hmm. it needs a little bit oil here. And now at the at the sauce. So this. It actually doesn't take that long. I think like, you know, the traditional one, like we just mentioned, if you use the soil bean paste, it, it takes quite some time to cook. Like you have to slowly fry the sauce. I think right. that's, a, that's where the name comes from. That's, a, that's why it's called fried sauce noodles because you have to fry the sauce like really slow and you right. know, like uh, simmer for like 15 minutes. So to, to actually get the, those fragrance out. For mm -hmm. for this, it, it it take like five minutes. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a question uh, yes. on what is sourcing wine and is it similar to mirin and can you replace it with mirin? No, uh, no, unfortunately. So Shaoxing wine is the uh, one of the most important uh, ingredients in Chinese cooking. For me, I feel like it's it's as important as soy sauce and vinegar. It's like the I, I would put it in the top three that you you absolutely need it to add flavor. So uh, Shaoxing one is a for, uh, it's made from fermented grains, um, and it has it it is not similar to mirin at all because mirin is really sweet, and the flavor is much lighter, and Shaoxing one is fermented for much longer, and it has a color. Uh, it has this. Um, Brown, like light brown color, and as a as a has a umami taste, almost like soy sauce. I feel like it has a pretty strong taste. Taste, uh, and the closest thing to replace it is dry sherry. You know, like not the sweet sherry, it's the dry sherry. If, like, I think if you don't, if you cannot find Shaoxing wine, you should go to check liquor store and just to get a bottle of dry sherry. And that's the that's is the closest thing to replace right. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I, 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 yeah. Sauce... yeah I want to mention ahead. because uh because the alcohol uh the alcohol content is pretty high. I think it's like 17% or something. So usually grocery stores cannot really carry them. Usually what what you can find in a grocery store is the salted one. They add like one percent of salt. So usually you you can either get that or some like, if you want to get a really good shouting one, you have to go to a like, like yeah, in certain state, you'll have to go to a special liquor store to get it. Yeah. Yeah. But you can buy in regular uh, Asian market, um, the uh, sourcing one uh, for cooking. Yeah, the salted one, the salted one. The yeah, one the that it has salt yeah. in it. Right. But uh, it's not salty though. It's very, uh, just a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. It's not, it's not like salty, mm. but it, it, it contains some salt. Versus right. the original one does not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wait until the sauce get a little bit thicker, and I'm just gonna add back the uh, cooked mushroom mm -hmm. and tempeh. Smells very good. So you, yeah. I I wish we had dared to smell this. It's it looks so good. So um, you know, since you're from Beijing, so most of your mm -hmm. would would you would you say that most of your recipes are uh, uh, based from uh, uh, Beijing, or how do you, 
or do you do you also experiment with a lot of other different regional I did, I did I did experiment with all kinds of things I think in this book I, I have I have quite a bit of northern dishes <clears throat> and I have Sichuan food which I love like spicy mm -hmm. it's like so good mm -hmm. uh, I do mm -hmm. have some Cantonese food um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know some takeout American Chinese takeout and actually mm -hmm. a few of uh, uh, Xinjiang Xinjiang food too mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna add the onion now. Okay. Oh my God, looks good. <laughs> yeah. So I I I add the onions. Like this is my mom's way to do it. Like she, I like to add this like at the very end, so it has this crunchy texture. You just uh, cook them for a little bit, so it does not have that roll taste, but it's still crispy. I really like the for this dish. Like I really like the plant based one because I think it's it's less fatty. I think the original mm -hmm. version is like a little bit. Um, it is kind of uh, heavy. You right. know the way oh, the, the, the sauce is. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, heavy. Because the oil, oil, the oil from the pork, especially they uh, generally they use um, pork belly. Yes, it's like very and so. Fatty. So all all the fat comes out in in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh this is healthier, and I really really like the texture. The because the mushroom and the tempeh they just soak up the flavors. It, it's uh -huh. it's it's really great, and I I also like the fact that it's not super salty, because I think the original one used a lot of uh, paste. You know, a little bit uh -huh. of pork to add flavor. It's like. It's a very intense and rich sauce, but this one I feel like you have all the different textures and a little bit onion to add, you know, like a vegetable. But it just have so many nice, uh, you know, like mushroom and tempeh. They just add so much to it. It's like I, I really love it. So, I, this is pretty much good. I'm gonna stop it now. It's I think you can, yeah, you can cook a little bit more, but I think I like it a little bit, like not too thick. You can mm -hmm. cook it a little bit more if you want a thicker texture, but I like this texture. And I, I like to add a lot of sauce into my noodle. <laughs> this is one of like one one of the reasons I like to use the black bean sauce and I dilute it a little bit. So, you know, so it itself is not very salty. So you can use like a lot of sauce. And I can, I'm going to grab my noodle. I already pre-boiled the noodles. Just take a second to um, put them in a bowl. So I want to quickly show you the noodles I use in this dish. Um, like this. <clears throat> uh, these are the one I use. It's from, it's, it's called Hawista brand. Uh, you can usually find this in Chinese mar market or like H Mart or Ranch 99. It's like pretty common brand. Uh, mm -hmm. I I really like this because it's uh, fresh noodles. It's refrigerated, but you can freeze them. But it's compared to the dried, it has a really really nice texture. Like they mm -hmm. all they also make so many variety, like you know Han shake or those like super fatty ones. It's they all have like really some are really really nice, has mm -hmm. a good like chewy texture. And uh, uh, for this dish, I think jajangmian. Um, I choose to use, this is called, uh, like they call it wife's noodles in English here, but uh, the Chinese translated to hand rolled noodles. So it's kind of like, a, not super, I'll, I'll pull one out, like it's not super thick, but once you boil this, it will become, let's see, it become like a little bit thicker. And I feel like I I I like to use this because it it is kind of chewy. It it's, it's I'd say a little bit close to uh, somewhere between wudon and yakisoba. I don't know if that's the correct way to say it, but it's a little bit chewy and it grabs on sauce really well. And and if you like other different texture, you can totally use different noodles. But this is the one I like to use for jajangmyeon. So I would just put the noodles here in this bowl. Uh, and add quite a bit of salt here. Never measure it. Like you, you can just add. <laughs> Yum, that looks like. so good. Yeah. It's really good, it smells so good. 
So you give it a stir and you can always add more if it's not salty enough. And I do have those, let me pull those out. Uh, cucumber that I cut. Uh, there are all sort of vegetable toppings that you can use on this. Um, the old, uh, you know, the Beijing style one, they usually use some uh, bean sprout, like really like lightly blanched bean, bean sprout and some cut um, radish and the, and the sliced cucumber. But for usually at home, I just use whatever that's available and it's easy to get. So here I have the per cut by hand. You can use uh, <laughs> madeleine to cut them because you know the because the sauce is very rich. It's like a rich umami with a little bit sweet taste, and this really crunchy, crispy, uh, refreshing. It's just like go really go well together. And I also like to add a little bit cilantro on top. Mm. That looks That's so it. good. <laughs> Yeah, yum! That looks so good. Um, well, it's it's actually it looks a very uh, you know um, simple way of preparing a meal. I think you can you can do this for an every night dinner too. It's just it would be it's, it's think, a wonderful. I think so. It's, yeah, it's a it wonderful is. recipe. Yeah, yeah, it, and also it, it you know, the longer you you know it holds pretty well in the fridge, and you can freeze it too. So if you want to do mm -hmm. like a little bit more and eat it later, it's totally. Totally cool. Oh, so you can, so you, you, you think that you can make the sauce ahead and yeah. just refrigerate it and, yeah. and you can just heat it up the next day if you, well, when you come yeah. back from work and just heat up a noodle and pour. Yeah. That sounds like wonderful. That sounds really yeah. a nice idea. Yeah. yeah. So what there is uh, one question there was that um, Maureen Merrill mentioned that uh, she has a, uh, a bottle of Taiwan sousing wine. Mm -hmm. um and she wanted to know if that's basically the same thing yeah I'm, i think so yeah yeah go ahead i, I uh, think it's I, I, yeah yeah i i think the only difference really is well first of all they're probably made in in taiwan which is different mm -hmm. places but i think uh you know the 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 south Sing cooking wine which is usually sold in the market um really is a little bit diluted than the than the one that's the, uh, that you, you use or uh, that you get from the um, liquor store, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. basically that's the difference. The difference really is diluted, yeah. and you said mentioned you mentioned that they also add a little bit of salt to it. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, the um, uh, the wine is the same wine. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I, I actually want to just like quickly show you in case you want to see. Like usually, it looks like this. Right. That's how it looks like. Yeah. Right. So. Um, if you if you get the wine from like a, a regular a, a liquor store, would you dilute it or use a lesser amount? Um, oh, I think or... it's it's fine. I, I because I think it's a little bit more or less. It's, it doesn't make that much difference because it okay when you cook it, it also cook off the alcohol quite right. a bit. And I yeah, I, I I personally like it kind of strong. Yeah. Right. Right. So um uh. Nisa again asks, uh, are the two dishes served warm or cold? Uh, so the, I'd say you actually can do, uh, so the, the, the noodle is usually a, a warm dish. So the, I, I actually, you know, it's because in the summer, you can actually chill the noodle, like the noodle itself can be cold, but usually the sauce is like, it's warm because it, it does not have a good texture when it's like, completely cool down and mm -hmm. I, I you can totally like make both like hot and like it will be great served hot but usually in the summer the noodles are cold and the, you know the toppings are cold and the the, mm -hmm. the sauce i'd say is warm it's not like piping hot but it's also not the sauce is definitely like warmer than room temperature uh and the potato noodle salad is it's usually i'd say it's a, either cold dish or if you just cook it, it's like warm, like either way is nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, uh, let's see. So uh, another question is, mm -hmm. if, if you want to make an oil light version, uh, could you substitute the oil with water? 
Hmm, <laughs> tricky. Yeah, I think I think you can try it because I I do read it because I think there are a couple of Chinese cookbooks. Um. Mentioned that I remember Grace Young's book mentioned that too. It's like, oh, if you really have concern about you know reducing fat or and oil like processed oil in the in the diet, like you should you can do all kinds of stir fry with a little bit of broth. Yeah, I remember. I remember. I learned that in cooking school. I remember even in French cooking, they're like, oh, you can use broth instead of right. oil for almost like all kinds of things. It just some things like it. I feel like. <laughs> you can, right? But it's some, yeah, it will be like it's not. It's not going to be the same, right? Right? Yeah, I I actually agree. It is, um, um, yeah. I mean, maybe not. Maybe we can reduce a little bit on the oil for the sauce because the sauce. Oh yeah, I think oil. so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. But but um, but definitely, the, you need oil to give it. A, you know, you need a little bit of fat to give it that that that. Mouthfeel, the texture, I think so. yeah. the flavor to it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, I love those two recipes; they're really great. So anyway, um, you know what I'd like to um, um, open up now is to talk to you a little bit about your background and and, mm -hmm. and how you got to uh, what you're doing uh, you know, here yeah. uh, in the U.S. So you said that you're originally from Beijing. And yeah. have you been, did you, did you cook um, when you were in Beijing and did you, uh, or, or is it something uh, that you learn along the way later on? Or... Well, it's kind when of did like you, a, when did you start cooking? Kind <laughs> of like a long story. I did not, uh, I did not cook growing up because I, I grew up in a very traditional Chinese family uh, where my mom's cook three times per day. It's like she cooks breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, and she did not want me to spend time on this because she wanted me to study, just to, you know, get better grade, like use, like spend more time on at the school stuff. Um, so yeah, I've been eating really nice, like simple, healthy, delicious homemade meals, like growing up, like for so many many years. And I kind of have an idea of how it is made because I do watch my mom cooking, but I rarely, rarely uh, help in the kitchen. I, I think I remember um, when I was in like middle school or high school, maybe I can make a fried rice and uh, like a scrambled egg and tomato, like the tomato egg stir fry, like those, the easiest That's thing. Fun. Yeah, like literally I can make like these two things and I can make instant <laughs> noodles. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, and then I uh, graduated from college and I, uh, I went to Japan for graduate school for two years. And that was the time I started to realize, like, oh, I really need to learn more cooking because otherwise I have no food to eat. And I started to calling my mom. I was like, oh, mom, how to make the cabbage stir fry? And she was like, well, just chop the ca cabbage. The, you know, you, 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 you stir fry them until it looks right. You splash of soy sauce and, you know, this and that. And I made them. I said, never taste the same. Never. Like, just like, no matter how I do it, it's just very different from my mom's cooking. Um, and then and that's when I started to read more uh, cooking blogs and recipe books and magazines. And actually most of those are uh, from Japan. Um, I found that extremely helpful because in Japan, I think they really do things really in a meticulous way. The, especially like a lot of chefs, they, they share so many pictures like pr how to prep things like this is, you know, what the ingredients look like, how you cut them and how it look, should look like when you cook them. So these things help me tr like really tremendously because I think in China, especially like back then when it's like 20 years ago, re recipes don't, they don't measure. Like you'll never find like correct measurement in you know, any recipe. It's almost this like right amount. You, right. you'll never always, see like- but... Yeah, right. a, pin, a pinch of this, a pinch of that. Pinch, that's pinch it. of things. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, and I think like it really helped me in Japan. It's like, oh, you actually have those measuring spoons, and you know exactly how much it should be, and that was very, very helpful. And I learned actually a lot of Chinese cooking. It's a little bit different. It's like the Japanese interpretation of Chinese cooking, but I learned cooking, how to cook Japanese food, Chinese food, and uh, you know some Italian food when I was living in Japan. 
and I started to, to cook more after I went back to China. So when you went, went back to China, did you uh, ask your mother to teach you more of the re different recipes? Yeah, I, for I forced her to be like, mom, stop now, I need to measure. And so I take, <laughs> I take all the, you know, like the, the potato recipes and the, you know, the noodles and the dumplings, I like, I, I asked her like, oh, stop, stop! Like, don't, don't move now! Like, I need to like measure it and then write right. it down. Yeah. So you, so you, that's how you really sort of beginning to slowly uh, write down yeah. recipes and and yeah. uh, still develop your own recipes as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, okay. So then, once you get, uh, then you came to the U.S. Um, <clears throat> what what did you do? Did you you started a blog right when when you got to the yeah. U.S. You started, yeah, and um. Omnivore's cookbook is your blog, right? By the yeah. way, if if any of you have not been to Omnivore's cookbook, you should go. It is an amazing blog. It's lots of information, beautiful pictures. Um, and speaking of beautiful pictures, I, that's one of the things that really uh, you know impressed me the most mm -hmm. on your blog is that you did such beautiful pictures. Um, did you learn to, to uh, uh, take photographs when you were growing up or in school or anything? Did you go to school for that? Uh, no, uh, I just really, really liked it. I did a lot of uh, creativity related things at school. I, I, I did drawing. I learned for, uh, Chinese calligraphy for eight years. Um, I, I learned wow, like graphic, wow. yeah, graphic design. Like, I, I do like those like <clears throat> art, art, artsy things. Um, mm -hmm. But I did not learn photography until I actually started blogging. And if you go to my blog, uh, click on the old recipe and go to the last page, you can see my first blog post. It's a tuna pasta something. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a tuna ar arrabbiata pasta. And uh, it was, mm -hmm. I, I updated that post like later on, but you, they, I included one picture I took. It's the first picture I took of food. It's like so bad. It's like yellow <laughs> and blurry. Um, <clears throat> nothing in focus that you can barely see the food is like pretty bad like yeah um, so i guess I, I guess if you go to your blog and see from the from the beginning yeah. you, you, you follow you get the yeah, progression you kinda, of, yeah, how you, how you develop your photography yeah. yeah well that's wonderful and so do you did you uh, later on um learn more about photography did yeah i i read a lot of uh i read a lot of photography books like generic books but then i also go to uh seminars and workshops and especially you know there are food blogger conferences where you know there are food bloggers who uh, photographers mm -hmm. they have those wonderful uh seminar like a uh, workshop where you can see exactly how they shoot and how they set up things i i just learn mm -hmm. a lot from them so and then a lot of practice at home too mm -hmm. so uh, you know your blog has been very successful so are you now able to just um actually be a full-time blogger um yeah right now i'm a full-time blogger right so excellent so you uh, how often do you set up uh, um create a uh, post recipes and such uh i try my best to do <laughs> two recipes per week per i try week. my best but it's hard it's very hard i i have 700 recipes on my website more than 700 yeah. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, like after a certain stage, it's like kind of like, oh, my God, I don't I, I need to think about what to cook next. And it took some <laughs> take some time to do research and like eating out, of course. Like, find out new uh -huh. things. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So what, what is your audience like? Do you find that you have a lot of um, uh, Asian uh, readers, uh, like Chinese readers? Or do you have do you find that I you think... get a, a lot more? Um, American, you know, uh, readers. I think my audience is really mixed because I have people from all over the world. I think like right. ha half of them are from the U.S., uh, which is not surprising uh, considering like later on, I do I feel like I do started to localize things more a little bit more after I moved here. Like you know, like those how how you buy things and how you cut things, like uh, and how you measure things. A lot of things are slightly localized to tailor to american readers but i do have like a very wide range of international readers and i i mm -hmm. do have you know like uh chinese american chinese like or immigrants right. who mm -hmm. would like to right. learn from my recipes usually they're 
second generation who are like, oh, I really want to make the, you know, my grandma's dish or my mom's dishes, but we didn't learn exactly how to make them. Uh, I do have mm -hmm. those readers, which, which I, I feel really, really happy when people are like, oh, I finally recreate this like dish. It's like tastes like, like, you know, my mom made. Sometimes I got mm -hmm. comments like that. It's nice. Mm -hmm. So there is a question for you that says, um, how do you make a living uh, as a full-time blogger? Um, do, you, uh, do you also do contract writing for people? Uh, so I do a lot of things. Um, so the first thing is like, you see those like ugly advertisement banners on my website, like <laughs> really not proud of that, but that's actually a main way of like make a living. It's just like, when, when I have a, like a large enough audience size, you know, you started to kind of apply to different uh, advertisement providers, like, you know, like Google or, or Amazon, or right? You know, like those, mm -hmm. those advertisers who want to, you know, put advertisement on your website. And they basically, I get paid by uh, traffic, like, you know, how much traffic you can, you know, how many people see this, you know, kind mm -hmm. of like a, a billboard, like, you know, if it's, you know, like really busy, commercial street is going to cost more for the advertiser to display it. It's kind of like the similar idea. I, I, mm -hmm. It's really kind of like, you know, have like conflict feelings because I do know it's like sometimes this annoying pops up. So it's just like difficult to read, but that's right. like how right. I make the living to offset right. the right. cost of running this. Of uh, course, that's one of thing. Um, and sometimes I work with brands uh, to promote their product. Um, and I do, I do uh, have photography jobs, like which is I, I don't really advertisement on my blog, but I do have clients who hire me to to do food stylings and you know like uh, consultation or on set you know like sh or, or shoot recipes for them. Um, mm -hmm. And I, uh, and of course I just released my cookbook, so that's right. you know you, you right. have to do that's like another... twenty things, yeah. But yeah, I think I think that's the life of a uh, food writer is that you you have to do all sorts of different things together yeah. and uh, make a living. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, okay. Now now <clears throat> now that you've got a, a cookbook, what is your plan? You have any future plan or anything that that you uh, <sighs> would like to do? I uh, I I think one thing is I definitely want to keep blogging like i love what i do and uh, i think mm -hmm. the really amazing thing about blogging is that it opens doors to like really un exciting and unexpected projects like there there are cer certain jobs like i'd never thought i'd do because I, uh, for example i think two years ago last year two years ago i went to a fly to uh, atlanta for this uh, food styling for a brand, you know, it's like I work with a group of photographer and food stylists and prop stylists and, you know, like a big team marketing and advertising. Mm -hmm, and we're mm -hmm. making those like beautiful images like hot pot or ramen and all that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, I was in charge of preparing the food so it looked authentic. And I, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I styled them so it looked nice so the photographer can take the photo. So, you know, right, it's like, right. I, I would never have imagined their job exists like that if it's mm -hmm. not for food blogging. So I think by keep doing this and, you know, just working on everything, like the photography, the writing and the, you know, like my book, it opens doors to, you You meet very interesting people and you start to right. find, like you get interesting projects along the way. Right, right. Well, that sounds like interesting. So I'd like to open up um, uh, to, the, to the audience also. So if you guys have any questions, please uh, post some more questions and 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 uh, hopefully Maggie can answer some of your questions. Um, let's go uh, going back to some, some of your recipes. I noticed that in your mm -hmm. cook, in, in this mm -hmm. particular vegetarian cookbook. Uh, well, okay, first of all, uh, it is vegetarian, so uh, but your your blog actually is not vegetarian. How did you yeah. get into vegetarian cooking, and wh uh, what? Uh, how did how did that come about? So, uh, so my my husband Thomas kind of started it is uh, because uh, so he's a runner and he trained for races and marathon, mm -hmm. uh, and he decided to try a plant based diet because uh, he find out that it helps people recover from races faster like trade when you have a very intense training you know you have like muscle pain and just like really you know need to recover from that he found out you know if you eat plant-based 
it, you are consuming less energy to digest the food and those food, you know, you, you actually can absorb the nutrition faster to, to help you recover faster. So we did this little, you know, a few months of testing. We just like kind of went for plant based for fun. And I, I really enjoyed it because um, I do, I practice yoga myself. And I found out that after eating, I can pretty much immediately exercise or do yoga or even like working. I don't feel like super tired or, you know, I need, a, I, don't, I didn't feel like I need a lot of coffee if I eat a, like a mm -hmm. big lunch. It's just mm -hmm. like a really nice way to um, to make your day a little bit more efficient. Um, and I, I do feel like there are interesting recipes and, you know, different uh, way to prepare food uh, that I, I wasn't exposed to. And so I started to get very interested in, in this project, uh, in this topic. And then we moved, after we moved to New York, I started to find, like, we went to, uh, quite a few vegetarian restaurants like I started to discover like vegetarian food and especially Chinese food as cuisine and it really kind of like blow my mind because I, I have those like I have a few like my favorite uh, Buddhist restaurant in Chinatown they're like have hundreds of dishes on their menu and they mm -hmm. pretty much recreate everything I've you know I've known for the, the meat version and they do it plant-based version as it's so flavorful flavorful and the texture is like really spot on and I was like wow mm -hmm. this is like so interesting how they did this and I think mm -hmm. it was a really interesting topic topic to explore because uh, I think there are there are a few vegetarian Chinese food out, out there uh, at the point but there's no plant-based you know vegan mm -hmm. Chinese food so I kind of wanted to explore this topic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. well you know uh, the uh, vegetarian uh, uh, food is is very common among the Buddhist Chinese. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's one. Uh, it, I, I guess there's a a lot of that in China. Um, do, how do you, do you are you inspired by many uh, some of the think, Buddhist I, Buddhist I think uh, dishes? When I was growing up, it was not mainstream in Beijing. I think I hmm. went to Buddhist uh, restaurant uh, in, like a couple of times, uh, mm -hmm. and the food was great. Like usually like the, the, the those ones i went before in beijing they were trying mm -hmm. to mimic the meat version like the they like i think they they instead of like you know serve you a lot of like vegetables and all that stuff what they are really trying to do is like oh uh, we're making this kung pao mushroom but they use like they try their best or, or like a mushu pork but they're using mock meat mm -hmm. you know you, mm -hmm. often they, the restaurant make those mock meat in, like in restaurants they try their mm -hmm. best to mimic the meat version. Like that's the uh, really the spirit of those Buddhist cuisine I grew up with. Versus, I think after I come to the U.S., I think the restaurants are slightly more diverse, and they have like a, a just more uh, recipes in general, and a lot of them are just like heavily, you know, vegetable dishes that are I just found them very nice. So I, mm -hmm. I think I, I, I got inspired from both. Both, okay, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, uh, there is a comment by Leonie that says, uh, would you consider writing another cookbook, uh, perhaps a book showing steps of preparations and such? <laughs> well, you do have, you do have I, I, noticed, I know that in, in your uh, book here, you do have some steps. Uh, uh, would yeah. you like? Would you expand on that? Um, I I did. Uh, I I do have those, uh, especially for dim sum. You know how to fold the scarlet oh, pancake, yeah. or you know, mm -hmm. how how to do mm -hmm. a like a spring roll. Um, that that is one thing that I really think. Um, it's, sometimes it's challenging to put all the step by step in a cookbook because it makes the book really big. So right. there are you know there are consideration from the publisher is like you know they. They do have limited pages because we, we get assigned for the words and the you know you how many images that they can actually mm -hmm. fit in the book that it, they can right. produce. So that is usually right. like a struggle. Like um, yeah, I've met like so many bloggers who are like, oh, you know, we really want to add more step by step photos because they're so helpful, but there is a limitation. So I do mm -hmm. think in that way, I love I still love to um, publish on my blog 
because we're, mm -hmm. you know, then I can share all the photos, that step by right. step and the vi videos that I want. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. So speaking of videos, so I think that's also the other way of, of showing the step is, is using yeah. video. And I think that's, uh, that's a, that's is a great uh, medium to to really uh, show the steps instead of you know photography. Yeah, it's a um, really so I, it's do, it's so you, straightforward. Yeah, I, I do have. Do you, do you do do a lot of video or not? Do you are I you do, now I do a lot. I do a lot yeah. of this. I used to uh, I used to do a little bit. It's so time consuming. It take forever. Just like uh -huh. set it up and edit it and all that stuff. It's yeah. so hard. But I, I feel, I think it's, it is really, really helpful. So since last year, I started to make more. I Now I try to make videos every week, at least one right. video per week, especially for some recipes that are, you know, like, it, it's interesting because when you see how people prepare things, like cut things, even like stir things, you know, in, in a stir fry, how you, you know, how often you stir it, how you flip things, everyone has their own style. And I do Correct. want to show it to my readers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I I agree. I think um, vid video is a is a great uh, way of of showing the steps rather than mm -hmm. using um, you know photography um, for step by step. Um, so yeah. So anyway, um, let's see. So do you uh, uh, let? Do you also collaborate with other food writers or not on doing projects and such? Uh, occasionally. I think I did more early days. I, I, some, I think these days, sometimes I just like really focus on my own work. So I, I, uh -huh. I, I wasn't reaching out much, but I think I, w I want to do more. Like I think that's right. collaboration is always really fun. And yeah, it's always right. fun to involve uh, like a team. To work on the something, right. yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, what about uh, different cuisines? Uh, uh, you, I mean, uh, you know, you mentioned that you 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 are you also do a, a explore different cuisines and such. Mm -hmm. Is this is that something that that you know you might um, get into um, you know more or uh, and how do you go about you know learning about different different regional cu cooking and so on? Uh, I always love um, all sorts of things. Like I love to cook all kinds of cuisine. Uh, I think, mm -hmm. but I think on my blog, I think I do share different things here and there. But I think what my reader really wants are the Chinese food, uh, which I understand the most, which like totally makes sense. So I mm -hmm. I do try to focus more when I when I talk about it on my blog. I do focus on Chinese food more, mm -hmm. but personally, like in private, I. I will cook like a lot of different things. I I I like Japanese food a lot. I feel like I mm. I I try to always make some Japanese food at home. Mm -hmm, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. we 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 make Indian food. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, okay, like Italian food and Mexican food. I it's like you know like a really like a mix of things. And some and mm -hmm. um, actually most of the time we make we keep it keep it really really simple. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think that makes a lot of sense because you know we uh, you know we we do live in a very uh, diverse uh, mm -hmm. society here in the U.S. Yeah. and it's yeah. it's great to be able to uh, you know share many of the other different um, uh, cuisine. So sure. uh, it makes sense, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, I'm I hope there's more questions. It looks like there's not too many questions out there. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, I've been. I'm really enjoying a lot of your, of your blogs, to be honest, because I, 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 I followed you for many, many years now. We, 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 we knew you. each other for yeah, quite a while. Yeah, quite a while. And, yeah. and I, 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 I followed your, your, your blog very, very uh, for a long time. And um, so how do you, do you, do you have any um, thought about your experience being a blogger? Is it something that, that has educated you also as uh, along the way, or is it, uh, or you know, has has it changed your perspective about cooking as you do your blogging? Oh, I think so, definitely. Uh, I think at the very beginning, I blog for I I, I write blog for myself. It's just like, mm -hmm. oh, I I want to eat this, or you know, like I you mm -hmm. know this dish. I I had this restaurant dish that tastes really good. I want to share that. It's like a more spontaneous and. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
yeah, just like kind of like whatever I feel like. You know, I could share like an Italian pasta dish if I thought, oh, I, you know, I just eat this in a restaurant. It's amazing. Let, let's see how to cook this. But I think over the years, I started, you know, be, it become more of a professional. Uh, and I started to do more research on how to do things. And, you know, I, I want to create really quality content. So there's some more things involved re in, uh, regarding like recipe research. And, you know, when, when you test recipes, you know, you probably want to like do it different ways and test the best, like you, you, you know, you want to share the best result. And, you know, uh, and also in terms of topics, I, I do I'll always ask my readers and do research about like what people really want to learn instead of just like, oh, you know, I, I want to eat this today, so I should talk about it. So it, it's mm -hmm. become more, I, I think now I write for my readers most of the time. Mm -hmm. I still write for myself, mm -hmm. which is really fun. Like I still like, like to share very personal things, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it become more like um, a process of creating a really consistent, mm -hmm. uh, good quality content that, that people want. Right. Now, now that you publish a book, uh, do you find that there's a difference between blogging and and writing the book and what is what is uh, what part of this uh, process that you really enjoy the most oh my god this book is so hard uh i feel <laughs> like i'm just so scared of doing something wrong and i cannot fix it because blog is just like oh i just publish i mean ob obviously i do edit multiple times my husband checked my like you know a copy do uh, copywriter right right, uh, right double right. double check everything and I still have like forget things like people are like, oh, you forgot to add the ginger in step two. I was like, okay, I just add it now. It's no, it's it's all right. But book is like when it's published, it's there forever. And I feel like really, really insecure about like, oh my god, <laughs> I, I, I maybe I should test this two more times just to make sure everything's correct. Right. Um, right. You know, because there's just so many meticulous things that. Maybe every right. time I tweak little bit things and I forgot to add a note and then it's like wrong. Yeah. Um, and, but, but for books, so on the other hand, I feel like I love the, book, the way the book presented a topic because on the blog, people might come into a recipe, they're like, where I found those ingredients? Or it's mm -hmm. like, oh, some, this, this looks really you know, unfamiliar <clears throat> and they don't really have a, you know, people have different experience and they might not resonate with certain recipe versus with a book. I can tell people, you know, go through the first chapter, you know, to those essential things. So you'll have like, you, you, I feel like you can put like a more systematic way in cooking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to explore a topic like way more detailed. And, you know, you can tell people, oh, you, after you make this sauce, you can make this and this and this. And it's right. only in one <clears throat> book. It's just like so much, so much easier. There's more depth to it, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, there's a question that, that asks you, um, well, um, Karen um, asked, uh, oh, maybe I missed this earlier, but when did Maggie start blogging and what was she doing before she became a blogger? Uh, I, started, <laughs> I started my blog in 2013, so quite a while ago. Uh, so and almost yeah, almost we, 10 years <laughs> yeah almost 10 years really fast um yeah and i was i was uh i was working at a bank when i started my blog and uh and the reason i started my blog was partly because i was not very happy at my job i was like uh, <laughs> i need to find something out I, I because i think you know like i said before i really really just always loved creativity work growing uh -huh. up like i i even did like i even draw some manga uh, in school, uh, you know, like I got paid drawing a manga for magazines and I did some like, you know, I, I, I got those like commissions to, to design covers of fictions, like draw those uh -huh. things. And, uh, uh -huh. I did that, like, you know, I have to make some, so make some a, money. This is like the, the, the Japanese manga. Yeah. Some Japanese manga. I, I even had, a, I think I designed some game characters for some tutorial game. like it's like it's it's like a study game but you know they have uh -huh. those characters i designed those characters uh -huh. for them it's like oh, yeah. i i did a lot of those things back in school and uh, of course like uh, chinese traditional family parents tell you no you have to get a regular job you know right, don't do this. Right, no, you're you're, right, you're right. not gonna make a living 
do the yeah, bad thing. Chinese. Very Chinese. <laughs> I was like, all right. Uh, yeah. Did it? Didn't like it. So I, I was. So I started vlogging on the side. Right. That's great. Um, yeah. Another question is, uh, what kind of camera and other tech that you use? Is there some? Is it? Um, what are the things that you that you you feel that's most important for your work? Um, you know, tools for photography and such. Uh, I I use a Nikon uh, D850. Right. It's a it's a very very nice uh, uh very nice camera. One of the top line. I I started mm -hmm. with Nikon because uh, I used to use my dad's camera. I think mm -hmm. my first one was like a Nikon seven seven two hundred or something. It's like a lower it's like a, like a much cheaper one it's just my dad's camera i was like okay i, I just i'm gonna use whatever we have at home and i you I, I always stick with the nikon line just because it's something i'm familiar with i know canon has like great cameras too but i always mm -hmm. use nikon and i mm -hmm. uh, gradually i kind of like upgraded a little bit here and like maybe twice over those years and and now i use a full frame d850 uh, and I use a uh, prime lens. I use a 35 and a 50. Uh, and I use a, do a micro lens that is 85 or 105. I cannot remember. It's like, it's one is for Canon, one is for Nikon. I use the micro lens for like a, it's like a long, long lens for close ups. Close up, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I feel like if you need one thing for photography, it just get a 50. So the 35 is like, you have like really wide shot. Like, you know, it's usually like an ingredient shot or it's like you, you're making like a hot pot spread, like a pretty, mm -hmm. you know, you want to show like a couple of things in the, in the picture versus 50 is just like, it, it, it works really great with food and you just focus on this one thing. You can work with different angles and it's, it's really nice. Um, mm -hmm. The zoom, the long lens is one of the most expensive one. I think it's nice in, certain angles and i don't i don't know i think it's nice to have but it's you don't have to have it to make big, good pictures um i use um i do have a tripod uh Man Manfrotto, uh it's no Manfrotto, how do it Manfrotto, uh, tripod for shooting my videos um i used to use the tripod to shoot my uh, photos too but i i i kind of got past it. I, I think it's like take too long to set up. So I just hand hold everything these days, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. is frowned upon by a lot of food uh, photographers. But I, I do like to hand hold my camera. Uh, I use one tripod for my video. Uh, I do mm -hmm. have one artificial light uh, to shoot video. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like this a continuous light. It's just like a but regular <clears throat> uh, neutral LED light that has like a soft box is like this big mm -hmm. you know that is like the bigger the soft <clears throat> box is the better the quality is like because it's great softer light um mm -hmm. i tried out different setups like i i kind of set up like I, I used to use have like huge ones but it's just like take up so much space so right now i have one that is like this big mm -hmm. um so, so yeah so I, when you when you do when you shoot uh, uh the the food pictures mm -hmm. you don't use uh, you use natural light you don't use um Oh yes, uh, uh, regular so light. For, for videos, I use uh, artificial lights just because um, if video is a little bit harder to edit than photos, like you have less control over, you know, right. white balance and the exposure right. once you shot right. it. versus yeah. pictures, you can just do so many things. With it, videos are really tough. And especially, right. I, I remember the first time I shoot with natural light, I was making dumplings. And it's just like, <laughs> this cloud just like, comes Came through by. and it's like, oh my God, it gets so dark. And then it went past and it fr it's bright again. I was like, I was ripening this one dumpling and it just <laughs> changes. I was like, no, that doesn't look right. Uh, right. So yeah, so I kind of like, I, I think, okay, artificial light is the way to go. So I do that for the videos, but um, mm -hmm. for pictures, natural light is just so beautiful. Um, I think yeah. you, you, you can make, great photos with artificial light, which I do sometimes, especially in winter. It's like the, when the time that, you know, the brace thing is done, it's like after a few hours, it's dark. I, right. I, and I got no light. So I do use uh, artificial light occasionally to shoot photos. And I think right. the pictures are fine. Like they're not like bad or anything, but natural light is just so beautiful. I just, uh, yeah, when, whenever I can, I shoot with natural light. Right. Great. Um, 
All right, so a few more questions. Uh, uh, the one uh, Jane asks you, uh, besides recipe writing, is there a difference in the amount of testing effort required for the blog and for book writing? I think a blog is a little bit easier. Um, usually I think I, I don't need to test things like you, like if it's a sim simple stir fry or something I'm familiar with, I shouldn't do mm -hmm. it more than twice because I kind of have an idea of how to put it together. So mm -hmm. it's, it can be done pretty fast versus books mm -hmm. are tricky because after mm -hmm. those times, when you think the recipe is ready, mm -hmm. you write the recipe, you, 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 you want to test it again, because I think that that is one of the, and, and also, oh, the other thing I want to mention, cookbook, you really want to test. Uh, it's like a really um, the, the right way to do it. After all the testing and recipe writing, you actually should hire someone else to test it again who like don't didn't know how to make it. You want someone who don't who are not familiar with the topic to able to make recreate exactly the same dish. So it's, mm -hmm. it is a quite a different process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you so you you feel that uh, for book writing the the recipe really should be more rigorous, rigorously tested. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, rather than blog blogging, yeah. Yeah, um, because if something's wrong, you just do it again. It's like, oh, maybe I forgot something. <laughs> like, let's try it again, and and and, and you just update, and it's done. Right, right. Um, so one more question: um, Do you feel like there's still uh, room in uh, to show personality in writing on a blog uh, versus the book, I guess. Uh, lots of blog writing seems to just focus on mechanics and um, and tips about recipe and no, and no personality. Yeah, so yeah. hard. This is a hard question. Like, it is, I, I, I kind of agree with it, I'd say, because um, there's a thing about between, especially when you do this, like for me, it's like, I've, I've done this for so long time, like many, many years. I do find out that there are certain industrial criteria that you have to meet. Like for example, you know, Instagram just did an update. Now you have to follow this formula. Otherwise you're, you're not getting any exposure just because the algorithm is designed that way. Or I mm -hmm. still remember like, I, I went to this photography for, uh, workshop and. And, and, you know, they're really famous uh, photographers. They're talking about styling and how you compose and everything. And people are like, oh, how I can get, you know, like a photo for Pinterest to get more, you know, uh, more, impressions. More eyeballs. <laughs> it's to totally different things. Like it, sometimes right. it's kind of opposite. Like the, the artistic approach can be, conf you know, it, it, it can conflict with whatever that, you know, platform you're trying to promote your content. It's like like uh -huh. the algorithm. It could right. be like quite like opposite. It it, it depends on things. Like it's hard to say. I think some people do it really really well. They like they 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 still let their personality shine through. But I do think that there is a limit because platform constantly changes. You know, like I there there maybe you it's this way is okay for a few years and then you know the platform changed or like new platform showed up. And people are kind of like, I feel like forced into like, oh, I now I have to do things this way. Otherwise, no, no one's going to see it. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. For me, I feel like I try my best to kind of balance things. It's hard. It's pretty hard. I do feel like it did. It does sometimes like give you less creativity uh, of like choices. Just the way, mm -hmm. be, like, oh, if you don't shoot close enough, nobody's gonna like you on Pinterest because people cannot see the food. <laughs> you know, it's like right, have right. to be in your face. You know, uh, I try to like make it still have something. You know, like I put some thought in it, but yeah, right. it's it's hard. Right. It's hard. Great. Well, I think we're almost up. Uh, our time is almost up. And so, um, and, you know, I think we could uh, wrap this up uh, from here. I, I would want to thank you very much for joining us here with Mocha um, and sharing your, your cooking experience and also your blogging experience. I think that's the most 
uh, that was, it's one of the exciting part about this is to learn your background and how you get to here. And, and of course, your recipes are wonderful. I love, I, I, I wish I could smell what you were cooking there. I think yeah, maybe maybe technology can change that sometimes. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> at at <Yeah>. some point. <laughs> but again, thank you very much for, thank for you. all this. It's so fun. Uh, it's like it's, I really enjoy this. Like, uh, so, and, and all the engage, like, you know, like answer questions. It's really fun. I, I like right. it. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.